Uh, hello, my name is Jim Clark. Uh, in my real life, I happen to be a manager at Oracle. I'm actually technical in my background, but I'm starting to graduate up away from the technical side. So to try to keep my hands in the technical space, I worked uh, started this open source project called Groovy FX. And uh, I've had some history with Java FX, and then I said, well, it'd really be cool to do Groovy with it. And it's sort of grown over about two years, and, and um, it's come to this. We've had a lot of c contributors to the project. Uh, you're welcome to join and contribute, uh, even if it's just using it and giving us feedback on what you would like to see next, that type thing. So in, we had a slide show pre, uh, ready, and that's what we gave over to the show, but we thought that was kind of boring. So what we're actually going to do is show you real code and real demos, and I think you might find it interesting. Uh, I'll introduce Dirk. Thank you. My name is Dirk Koenig, and that's all that counts. I work for Canoe. Let's start with coding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that it was for the presentation. No more slides. So going over. Um, since we do a lot of demonstrations which are um, not really well visible in, um, on slides anyway, I'm going to do a screen capture. And um, if you follow my Twitter account, which is at Mitty, then um, you, you will get the information where to find it. Can I somehow? Yes, please. Thank you. So, um, Groovy FX. We can talk lengthily what Groovy FX is. Well, in the first place, it is a very thin veneer of Groovy on top of the Java FX powerful, awesome, rich platform. And um, we will go a little bit into that project. But before we do this, I'd like to introduce how you can use it from a user's perspective. And I'm actually spending a lot of time, a lot of my business time, a lot of my um, programming time by just using GrooveFX. And um, I'd like to start with the, with the control or some, some use case that I implemented on my flight from Switzerland to San Francisco as long as my battery would hold. And if you, I guess some of you have flown uh, economy class, that means that the seat before you hits your forehead <laughs> and you have your laptop like this and you do what I call accordion programming. You're on your belly. Right? <laughs> so this is how the following code uh, was written. This is a control that I call, which is a dial. You'll see, you'll see it. I shall first show it, how, how it looks like. Um, Oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. Uh, radio control. Go here. I'd like to... You can see it's real live right now. Cause yep. See it's making our mistake. <laughs> started started the wrong uh, code here. Here it is. So, in one of our applications, we had the request for, um, with your finger, entering a number. Hmm. So how do you do that normally? You use a slider. And a slider gives you a left, a left um, value and a right value. And, um, but it is always difficult what values you choose for left and right because that also influence, influences your precision that you can possibly have with your finger. I guess everybody has seen that before. So here we do have something which is close to a slider. You can click on it. and but you can just turn around it like so. So you, you can think to go from zero up to uh, 360, for example. Bless you. Yes, and uh, since you have this uh, geometry in, in this radial control, you can, if you're very close to the center, you can spin around very quickly and even go to high or low numbers. So in clockwise would be, would be to high numbers, right? That's something that you cannot do with a normal slider. But still, you can be very precise by using the geometry going outside and having only a slight thing over here, right? Slight um, change in value, putting it to a certain value like so. 
And that was the idea that I wanted to implement. Um, yep, and then. You know, one on. thing to notice is as he's moving the dial around, the value is updating, and this is done to a Groovy FX feature called binding, and we'll show you how we do that. It's built on top of Java FX. Yep, and uh, here's here's all the code, all the code. Radial. It is a dial, and it is radial in shape, so it's a red dial, <laughs> uh, pun intended. So the whole code of of the dial is actually um, this is pretty much it. This, is it visible from the back? Uh, maybe like so. It is a circle. It gets an ID. It has a radius. Yeah, the fill that gives us this uh, Kunststoff feeling is a linear gradient from the Gainsborough color to the dim gray color. Don't ask me how I chose those. Um, and it has a stroke around with this, with the, with the border, which is a gradient that goes from white to black uh, with a width of eight. Now the inner handle where you can put your finger on, so to speak, um, is just, this, just another circle with a linear gradient that goes from black to white but has an opacity of only 0.5. And that's for a reason. Well, let me show the, the code again. Why is, why is that? Um, yep, here you go. So I'm not quite sure whether over the beamer you get the same effect, but if you would have been asked whether this blue is the same color as that blue, you would say, no, this looks lighter than the other one over here, right? And that's because here the blue is contra contrasted against a white. Is it visible? Almost. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. And here it is con contrasted against the black. Hmm? So that makes the blue appear lighter or, or less or more bright. If we would do this, this here with uh, fixed colors, we would have the effect that over here, the darker color contrasts against a, um, a light gray and here against a darker gray. And in one of two places, we would instantaneously have like too hard an edge for that. And one thing to consider when, when with these kind of controls is you would never want the user to click on something that appears to have a hard edge. Because, you know, your mouse is like, like your finger and you're kind of reluctant to click on anything where you c may hurt your finger. It's a kind of psychological uh, thing to, to keep in your mind. So that's kind of all kinds of considerations that you can have when playing around with new controls. And um, Groovy FX makes it very easy, now that's the point, the point to drive home, to uh, play around with these values and, and start again and do all that. So the indicator line, the red line, um, is just that you have seen when I click on it, has per default a transparent stroke, so you don't see it per default. It starts in the middle. And there's a text which is bound against the value of the dial. This is the binding that uh, Jim has mentioned. And the value is dark red, and it is repositioned to some other place and so on. So that it was. Now, when I start dragging the mouse, I get the, the coordinates over here where the dragging is currently uh, located. I set the indicator stroke to red. Huh? That's the indicator. That's how you do it in GroovyFX. And it has an end X and end Y position for that stroke. Huh? That's so that it all um, is updated automatically. Um, I also give to the main, I give a drop shadow. I may not, you may not have recognized that drop shadow in blue, in light blue, which gives the indication that the dial is no, now on in action. Hmm? Have you seen that before? Like, dim. If I start clicking, it has this glow around it, and the glow is gone again. Glow, and it's gone again gives you a very good indication of what you're currently modifying. Hmm. And by the way, a glow is nothing else but a drop shadow in a different color. It's a good trick to, to take away. 
I learned all these tricks from Gerrit Grünwald, right? You know, if you have any seen, if you have ever seen any of his work, you will recognize it. <laughs> and then we have to um, kind of uh, do the mathematics here um, to go from x y positions into polar coordinates to to um, work with the radius and um, and the angle, really. So I, I chose this uh, rho and theta words from the polar coordinates, and then I have to translate x and y position uh, of the handle to the respective place, and that, that it was. And then I set the theta um, value of the dial. The dial is now what would be in, um, if you do standard controls in Java FX, would be the control, respectively, the behavior, more the control, really. It has a bindable value such that any other Java FX control, Groovy FX control, can bind against it. And all the various methods that you have to implement, a set value, a get value, a value property method, and even a value method, and all the checking whether the value really changed and so on, is all in these methods automatically injected in the bytecode. So the FX bindable annotation you send there, see there, it, it just says that the next property is going to be a Java FX property, and it generates the uh, the getters and setters for the value, but also behind the scenes generates the property itself. Um, there's two ways to use it. In this case, it's just going against one property of the radio value class. You can also annotate the class with this so that all the property uh, properties within the Groovy class will have this JavaFX properties generated. And the way you access the value is you can call value left paren right paren and that's actually pulling the property back rather than the actual value at that time. If you scroll down we'll show that to you where you did the bind. Oh, what well, the bind is uh, over here. So here you have the bind on the dial class, and it says dial.value. So what that's really saying is on my text line is to whenever the value of the dial changes, then it uh, basically the text will get updated with that new string, the value string. So as the value changes, the text automatically gets updated, and that's the only coding you have to do to tie the two together. Um, a couple of the other features in Groovy FX, if you notice the fill argument here has dark red. Uh, so all the color, standard color properties are first class like IDs within Groovy FX. So you don't have to double quote them or do anything special. They just get interpreted as colors. Um, the fill, the Groovy Blue, we added our own. You could add your own colors. We added Groovy Blue as a to the standard list of colors. Okay, there was. <laughs> the other key thing here is where you see like the pane with the ID that says radial. Well, once you do that, then radio actually becomes a variable accessible through your to your groovy code. So we can uh, identify the pane. I think you do it later in another class, but you can actually say radio dot whatever and set the properties on that pane, which is kind of a neat trick. Now that was playing around a little, showing you with uh, what little code that was, 70 lines of code, what you can achieve. Hmm? That's really uh, something which would take you, which would take me at least <laughs> a week if I would have to do it in swing, if at all. Right. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so um, something that you can do. That, that was more like, um, like a little teaser, right? Now let's look, what's, what is the minimum amount that you have to do for using Groovy FX? And that's it. Um, you just start, you're using, so mic is big, a little bit bigger, uh, like so, good. You're using the start method. And it takes a closure, but if you don't think about closures, just think open brace. 
And then there's a stage inside, and inside the stage there's a scene, and inside the scene there's a stack pane, and inside stack pane there's a text. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. And uh, so we have a text note here, it has a fill. What else may it have? So you said white, but you could have just said white, right? Uh, yeah. I don't necessarily need to have that as a string. It is there as, as a variable. And of course, it is, um, I could translate it, for example, translate x and give it a certain value, whatever. Hmm. So this, this is how you do it in, in um, I should start it, huh? Give you some, give you some idea of what we do here. Fill with white. Oh, that's that's rather small. So that's not not the final thing that we would like to have. Now we play around with it. Say, we want to have a font, and the font should be mm -hmm, thirty-six point. That's good. A ramble. Sorry? Try Amble. Amble. Is that like try so? It. Yeah, try it. I don't know if we have Amble installed or not. We'll see. <coughs> yeah. Yep, that is. Um, and certainly we would like to have a reflection on that effect. Reflection. And by the way, you get um, you see the the reflection class, which gives you a good hint that reflection is probably available, like so. Try again. So here you go. So well, that's that's an easy way of playing around with uh, possible. Groovy FX code. Now, um, if you want to do this, you would need to have Java FX installed on your machine. There must be a Java FX installation, and this installation includes uh, in Java, JFXRT, which stands for Java FX Runtime .jar, and this must be explicitly on your class path. That's a catch. Because, and that's not a catch because of Groovy FX, that's a catch because of Java FX. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't start correctly. The, um, so even if you have the latest Java 7, which also includes and already has on the class path all the Java FX, you need to have an extra entry um, in your class path. So this, bless you, this is your uh, escape. This is your class path over here. And... Um, You'll see that this Java 178, what? Well, Java 1708 early access preview. There's some Groovy, and, uh, and yes, you need to have Groovy, hmm? one way or the other. I, I have the latest Groovy over here, and uh, I have the runtime jar. You can fetch the latest Groovy FX jar um, manually, but you don't need to. Um, Groovy has this feature of so-called grab. You can use the grab annotation and say grab and give it um, or coders Java FX. I'm not quite sure. So the the actual Groovy FX, right? Groovy, Groovy FX. F Groovy FX. Can't remember what he named it. <laughs> and then, then the uh, the module, which is Groovy FX, and then the um, 0.3.1, and this will automatically download it from the web, install it locally, and you can send your code to anybody who has no, even not Groovy FX installed. He must have Java FX installed. So that's the the way that you can use it. Yes. Let's do a couple quick demos. And now we have like, um, we like to go through a number of, of further demos with, uh, that are directly in the Groovy FX. Groovy FX comes, um, is on the web. If you search Groovy FX, you'll, you will see the, uh, the homepage. 
and it comes in the in the demo folder are many 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 demos. In fact, we have a little more demos than we have test cases. I'm afraid. I think but, the, the demos <laughs> are the test cases. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever we do a change, we have to go through all the demos and see whether they still work. And um, what is your favorite demo, Jim? Um, let's start with analog clock, clock, since I wrote that. <laughs> that one? Yep. So it's going to actually build it, and um, you see it This here. was, um, if you're familiar with JavaFX, there is a JavaFX version of this, and I wanted to test binding, so I ported it over to GroovyFX. And so, um, let me show you some of the code here. Go up, to, uh, go up to the top first. So we have this class time and we keep the hours, minutes and seconds and then we keep all the angles for the hour hand and the minute hand and all that stuff. And then um, basically for the time we, we update the time, the hours, minutes and seconds and they get bound to the angle. So as you are changing the clock the, the angles for those hands automatically changes. And again, we just, uh, this is straightforward Groovy FX. We have a stage, and then the, here's using some Groovy syntax to actually um, create the little ticks around the clock. So we can just use the for loop and, and generate that as a list, which is just a bunch of, um, I guess, circles we used. Mm -hmm. And then later on, the circles will get installed into the scene, which is the uh, where it says nodes, hour dots. That's just pulling that other list in. So you can kind of mix and match how you build the scene graph in different ways. Node is just a generic include a JavaFX node. And then um, uh, again, we have the, the different parts of the clock thing. Then as the time gets updated, it just causes the, the you can see where the, in the bottom there, where it says bind time that second angle. And then you got for the middle hand, you got time, uh, time that minute angle. As those values get updated, it actually updates the graphic element. And then uh, this uses a, um, there's a lot of animation uh, classes in JavaFX. This one we use what they call a, a sequential uh, translation transition. So basically this is going to update the transition or the X and Y values and then it runs indefinitely but then I just set the timer to one second. If you see there the pause transition it's using a groovy syntax which 1.s gets translated into a JavaFX duration of one second. And then as that pause terminates, it calls uh, the groovy function on finished, which actually invokes the time at another second to it. I mean, I know it's not precise for you guys that are really in there, but <laughs> you get the point. Yeah. And still, it's all groovy code, and that means we, I got the normal support in groovy code, which is, here's my time object, here's the respective method. I can command click on that one, and I will send over here, I can say, out of seven, please give me all the people, on all the places where this is used, and if there's only one place, it directly jumps to it. So in your normal IDE, you get all, all your support. It's not like an external file that the IDE doesn't understand. So go back to that method. If you see here in the method, all I'm doing is recalculating the seconds, minutes, and hours. And there's nothing there at that point that's recalculating all those angles or updating the screen. Through binding, which was up before, whenever a second changes, it recalculates the second angle. It should be up a little bit. We can see where the seconds are bound. So okay. I'm, I made a find usages. And here you see where the, where the second angle property binds against the seconds, times 60. And uh, here's a little catch. If you, know, if you have ever seen the, the binding that is in, the, um, in JavaFX, you can bind against an expression. 
right? But the expression is made up of method calls. It is in JavaFX, this would read um, seconds property, open parent, close parent, uh, sorry, open parent, and then you would, on the value, you would have, in the, in the, on the object value, you would have to call a method called multiply and give it the number six, which is okay for an API, but doesn't read nicely. It's nicer to have the real mathematic expression being visible like so, and with Groovy uh, meta program, with the, sorry, with the Groovy method object protocol, we can actually implement th this uh, operator very nicely and uh, make it appear as, as a mathematical expression, even though behind the scenes, the exact same thing happens as if you would write object proper seconds property, open parent, new object property, dot yeah, multiply six, close parent, close parent, semicolon, right? So here, very concise, you can do something that takes a little bit more when you're in the Java world. Uh, we have support for like a lot of different operators, uh, multiply, divide, subtract, uh, I think modulus, a couple others, I can't remember all off the top of my head. Groovy in Action, the book has all the operators in chapter one, or so, chapter two. Okay, I wrote the book a bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, FXML, demo. FXML demo was requested from the audience, yes. Was so that, Was that a planet? <laughs> Did he tell you to say that? <laughs> so, the, there's, for the FXML, you, you may have seen, there, there have been many talks about Java FX and Scene Builder. And Scene Builder allows you to create an FXML file. And this is fully supported with Groovy FX. You can use your Scene Builder and save your FXML file. And what we do is, if you have such a file, you can easily say FXML at any point in your scene graph and give it the file that you're going to draw in and go to the text of it. This is how Groovy reads the text from file. There's other options here too. There's a resource tag we use which will actually, you can give it a URL to go into your class path to try to find the FXML file or you could just pass in a URL to some location. Yep. This is just one way to do it. And then, um, that's actually my preferred workflow. You do the whole layout in Scene Builder, but what you lay out, what you're layouting is more like containers, and you give your containers uh, IDs. There's an FX ID um, attribute on every no every possible node. Sorry. Yep, there's, a, there's another one that it, it which is a bit different, uh, different and we'll, we'll come to it in a second. Okay. Thanks. Now, I just wanted to, to drive the point home that uh, you can get hold onto any ID programmatically uh, with, with only this little um, API call. From your stage, you go to the scene and you look up this ID and then you get all elements that are um, that have this ID now an ID. There should only be one node with with one ID in your scene graph, right? This is not enforced by JavaFX, but this is the uh, convention for an ID. Huh? Now we can get hold onto the title property of that and change the title. And this is uh, how we can get hold onto the various elements in the scene graph, even though they have been constructed with Scene Builder and being put into an external um, XML file, right? Does it make sense? Oh, cool. Now, since Dano has requested this one, here is uh, this little bit more code, but effectively the same um, approach. This just demonstrates that you can use strings to load up the FXML if you, if you just decide to do that. Just showing different ways to load the FXML. Is your question going to be about getting at the controller class? Or? <laughs> no, it's, it's down at the bottom, actually. It's All right. Accessing the values of the ID, the CSS ID and the XML ID, and the stack being on 161. This one? Yeah. So, in the FXML in my demo, by CSS ID and FX ID, I name those items. And in the closure, you just get them. Ah, okay. 
True. Yep. So there's even much better to support than the explicit lookup. All the IDs that GlobiFX finds in when passing the XML file will be, as we call it, in the binding of the script. So you have them directly available as if there would be declared variables and there would be some uh, property binding or so. Hmm? Just okay. in uh, for, full Those disclosure, years. we recently had someone ask uh, that they wanted to get at the controller. And I guess if you're pure FXML, you're not supposed to get at the controller, but we don't have a built-in way right now to instantiate the FXML with a controller object. We just do what's defined in the FXML file. Uh, that's probably something we can look at adding in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lighting effect demo. Sure. <laughs> we're now doing something that we haven't re rehearsed in <laughs> because oh, we, we are so confident that things work. So here's a light effect. Um, and light effects are really, really easy to use. Let's look into the Some code. of these demos are very simple because we're just trying to demonstrate one aspect of the language. Uh, let's yep. get running well, lighting on effect. time. Yep. We have like 20 minutes All to right. go. That's fine. And lighting is meaning setting an effect that it was, right? There's a number of, of properties that you can set for lighting. You can have the lighting in a certain position, in a certain distance, in a certain angle on top of it, and it will consistently have like um, reflections on your object and also drop shadows and so on. So that is, that is really an interesting um, an interesting feature. It's a JavaFX feature, but it's so easy to use from GroovyFX. Let's do the swing demo. The swing demo? Cool. Swing, 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 swing. Swing demo. So yes. this, this demo shows how you can use GroovyFX with the swing builder and the uh, GroovyFX builder. So if you have a mixed swing JavaFX project, that is how you can do it. It has a border layout in Swing and a text control in Swing and a button in Swing. But the, uh, the content pane, so to speak, in Swing terms is in JFX panel. And it shows the web view, right? So this is combining in the web view JavaFX object with Swing objects. That go. Your internet working? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try. Does it go? Or maybe not. I have no idea whether I'm really hooked up to the internet. We'll see. If not, you get the you, you get the message, right? So how does it look like in the code? Uh, for it is pretty decent. We have a default URL. We have a swing builder. Those of you who have, you have done some Groovy in the past know the Swing Builder. And now there's also Scene Graph Builder, which is for JavaFX. We do have the JavaFX panel with a certain dimension. We have some logic to set a URL. And actually, in the Scene Graph, we defer to the, to the web view engine and let the US URL load. So the, the defer method just means uh, invoke this when it's on the JavaFX thread. It's similar to the EDT thread from Swing. Creating the scene. Um, but the interesting part comes here. In Swing we say please inside the EDT create a frame with this title and with a border layout have a panel which goes into the center automatically and has a, have a, sorry, which is a border layout north. And it goes north, there's a text field and a button that we have seen with an action performed for setting the URL. And then there's a widget which contains the FX panel. The widget is a pass through node that, that allows you to pass in any node in your system. Now, now while we're at it, think about custom nodes. We do have a custom node thing that we haven't uh, looked at it either in the rehearsal. <laughs> 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 but it, but um, um, 
the custom field is really cool, and I'll show you first so the, the custom field, how it works. The custom field is a normal text field, and um, I'll make it a little bit bigger, like so. And, um, but it, does, it only allows A to Z to be, to be entered, so I can do A, B, C, D, but when I want to enter like uh, number one, for example, which I do now, this is, this is, this is, well, the sound effect is me. <laughs> but it's easy to do sound effects. He comes with you when you download. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I distribute it personally. At the time. So, and, and how difficult is it to have like such a custom component? Well, and, and use it inside um, GrooveFX. Yet it, here it comes. You do custom field demo. Uh, boop, boop. Let's start over here. It has a little description. You see the author, so you know it, it has some API description. <laughs> you just a bean factory under the name reject field, and here is your class. And that means that inside your Groovy FX code, you can just use this node reject field because it was registered this way. And you can give it additional. Um, properties, for example, what is allowed inside, and also uh, what should happen in, in case that something disallowed is entered. When um, first we press enter, <laughs> and second, if, if this happens, we are shaking, and shaking means we have a sequential transition which like rotates over uh, three times in a duration of 0.1 seconds, and then moves back to zero. And, and here is um, when input reject, this is the logic that should happen. We, should, we want to play the shaking, this is the shake. And this is the reject field. This is how you can, it's one of many options to have a custom component in JavaFX. You're extending from, from an existing one, and then you override the methods that you're interested in. This is now replace text and replace selection. Very easy. Hmm? Since you're looking so closely in the audience, I want this make it a bit easier for you to see. And it's all on the web. If you go to the GrooveFX GitHub page, you can directly see it on the web through your browser, see that code, let it run on your machine. Try the action demo? Uh, action demo. In the last talk, we have heard that there is no action abstraction in um, in JavaFX, and I mentioned, well, you should use GrooveFX anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, I was close to saying that. Um, and um, contributed by Andres Almirai, the uh, ah, Andres over there. Thank, thank you for that contribution. We now have also actions as we have in Swing. You can say there's an FX action. It has an ID. It has a name. It has an on action. What should happen, and so on. And then later, you can refer to, for example, the open action and have the open action on a menu item. And this has all the behavior that you know from Swing. In our terms, um, actions are a presentation model for something to happen. It is actually a presentation model because they capture state like is it enabled, disabled, what is the icon, and it's consistently displayed no matter what, whether you have it on a button or a menu item or somewhere else. That's, that's the whole purpose of an action. So why don't you show the canoe demo you showed me? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so one thing that, that uh, we demoed at the keynote was how you can use JavaFX for real business applications, right? So real business applications are usually server-centric. You want to have your application running on the server, but you want to have JavaFX with all its capabilities on the client. So um, there's a new technology called Dolphin, um, made by Canoe. It's open source. And um, I can close this one. Oh, let's drop it for the moment. Go over here. And I'd like to show you a demo of it, the push demo. 
with um, all the application logic running on the server, it's actually pushing vehicles around, so to speak. And uh, vehicles have an XY coordinate and they have a color and, um, and a rotation angle where they are in space. Here is two different uh, master views, like a map view and a table view and a detail view on the top. When I select any vehicle over here, it gets selected in the detail view. It also gets selected in the other master view over here with this, um, with this border, which is a cyan border. You, you see these, uh, these little vehicles are actually plain rectangles with a lighting effect on top of it. That's all it takes. Actually, only the group where they live in has a lighting effect and it applies the lighting correctly no matter how they are rotated. Right? It's always correctly from the top to the bottom. If you would like to do this with a gradient color or so, yeah, it's going to be difficult. Hmm? So the lighting effect is really cool. What you can do as well is uh, selecting in the map view over here. And you'll see the, the selection being updated in the other list view and in the, in the, default, in the um, detail view. I can even change on the client, let's say the Y position, which will result in the selected vehicle going upstream and landing over here. And then after so many seconds will be updated anyway from the server side. So let's try zero and it goes up here and it's also reflected over here that the new Y position is zero. And all this happens without any view knowing any other view. You know, that's the important part. No view knows any other view, not even indirectly through a controller or so. You're writing this code and you can write any view totally independently and only knowing its presentation model and nothing else. This is valuable for itself, even for a standalone application. But now comes the trick. The presentation model can actually live on the server, and the server logic can decide how it manipulates, how it changes the presentation. What is in the presentation model? It is, we, we have four instances of the presentation model, and each instance has four attributes, like so, like for the color, x, y position, and the angle. That's all it takes. That's all what the, what the client needs to be concerned about. And whether the client displays it as a map, as a list in, in, in a table, or as, an, as a detail view for the selection only, the server doesn't need to care. This is all information that only resides on the client. The server determines what to display. The client knows how to display. That's the division of labor that we have. And this is truly important for business applications, right? It's not about small prototypes or so that you're writing. And we have a number of customers that use the exact same approach with totally different UI technologies. Of course, our preferred one is JavaFX, but we also have clients using it with uh, Eclipse RCP, and one is using it with String. So you can actually bind against it from all those uh, various UI technologies. In the back here, you have seen what, what happened between client and server. There actually is a, a long polling going on. The server is polled for updates, and whenever he has something new, he closes the, the response, and it will be automatically displayed on the client. How does it look like? Push demo. There's a custom action, what happens on the server. The server has the server dolphin, so to speak, registers a custom action for, for our application. Hmm? And the client shows the view. So here's the push view. The push view is started with uh, the Dolphin instance for the client side, and the Dolphin instance is able to send a, com a command. Command here, for the sake of type safety, is inside. I click here in the properties class with a constants that is used. I'll go back. And um, there's a selected vehicle, which is a specialized presentation model. And, oh, the class is client presentation model, so you see there is nothing special. There is no vehicle presentation model or so. 
it is a generalized solution. You don't have to share any code between client and server if you don't want to. Only these constants are uh, interesting to share between client and server because you want to have consistent constants on client and server. As we call it, um, making the semantic dependencies syntactic dependencies. Good. Make life easier. Right? Make life easier. <laughs> you can refactor through client and server at the same time. Yeah. So let's look into not so much the, the map view, but for example, the list view. The list view is based on an observable list of client presentation model classes, which is this observable list of PMs. Let's look where it's used. <coughs> Command shift F7, F3. So the table items, table is the table that we have seen, um, is set to the observable list. And this never changes. It never changes. The table is bound against that list, period. Never changes. Now we add a listener to that, to that uh, respective observable list and need to make this, whenever this list changes, means there's a new vehicle being available. So we have to do whatever needs to be done. For example, the map has been, uh, th there's a new entry in the map that needs to, be, needs to go in there. Right. And um, yeah, there may be a new selection and so on. There, we must have a rectangle which needs a mouse click handler and so on. So this is when, the, when it's filled, when there's new, uh, the, there's new information available. Now, when the main loop starts, we are now more in the bottom of the, of the code. We are sending a pull command for starting the main loop. And pull command gives us back all the currently known vehicles, their presentation models respectively. And what we do is for every presentation model that comes in, this is an unfinished handler that we are executing. When it's finished, it's sent asynchronously when it's finished, we know that we have to put this presentation model inside the list of all our presentation models. Right? That's, that's all we have to do because the table view of JavaFX will automatically display the information. That's it. Um, from, an, from a groovy FX point of view, <laughs> and I have a little te a small teaser here for, for Jim, okay. um, we do have a special kind of binding that we're using here. We're using the command syntax from, from Groovy to say we would like to bind the X attribute of the selected vehicle, which is the, def the um, presentation model for the detail view, to the text attribute of selected X. Selected X is the text field that contains the uh, selected vehicle thing, the X value of the selected vehicle, which is a simple binding. Now. This bind method, the way that this bind method works, um, is not, it's special for Dolphin. Dolphin comes with it. I can go into the bind method. It comes from JFX binder, which is an extra class. Can go back. And uh, my suggestion was that we have some kind of this binding also in Groovy FX, but I guess we haven't decided yet on whether we want to have it or not. <laughs> so uh, that's still an open issue. I've uh, been playing with it. I just haven't pushed it up yet. Okay. Ah, oh, so cool. So if, if we reach consensus yours. that we want to have it, then it's going to be in Groovy FX as well. Makes life easier for Dolphin if, if it's in the standard distribution. Good. And then you can have specialized binding, for example, on action when there's a, in the enter key being hit inside the, the text field. Or you can have bidirectional binding by saying, well, First I bind in this direction and then I bind in the other direction. Selected vehicle, you can give an, a conversion logic to it. When there's an integer, it needs to be converted into a string and vice versa for display. And that's, that's how you do the binding. And, af and after that, there's uh, some selection listeners that needs, need to update the various selections. So that's, um, that's pretty easy. It's all open source. Dolphin is open source. If you go to, to um, GitHub open dash Dolphin, you see all that code and can work through it. What I thought was good about this was like I started with GroovyFX and you're down at this level just trying to get 
JavaFX working in Groovy, and now I see it progress over the year to where you have a full-fledged application doing client-server work and combining the Groovy FXN and just showing you the progress of uh, what the open source project's been doing. Suppose we could take a have a few minutes for questions if anybody's. Call. Um, what, what other features that you feel need to be added to uh, Well, the binding was one that I uh, was playing around with, the um, which is probably the most. I mean, a ge more general binding type mechanism. Um, the other thing is just keeping up with all the latest changes in JavaFX. And yeah. We certainly uh, we, we welcome all contributions. If you would like to join the team, that's more than welcome. Um, we are currently 0.3.1, and I would say what's missing for a 1.0 version, or maybe keeping up with the, with the version numbers that JavaFX has, is um, first we are always lagging behind a little bit with, with um, providing specific notes for all the functionality that is in JavaFX. Second is we have to complete the documentation. That's the biggest part. That's the biggest part. Uh, we also have to, we can go further for the automatic testing. That we, There's only a small amount of test cases in there. I would say we have to do more. Um, the reason why we don't do more is first, it's, it's very visual. You have to see whether things look correctly. Second is uh, JavaFX, which we would have used for the automation, is not quite there we will, where we would like to have it. Um, and yes, all, all contributions are welcome. Right. That's, um, that's for sure. I've done some experiments with the um, Invoke Dynamic option that's come out in Groovy 2.0, and, and there's a few bugs we've been uncovering along the way, but the performance is much, much faster. Yep. And, and especially when you have a UI tech thing where you're doing a lot of looping, Invoke Dynamic allows all that code to be uh, jitted so that it's executing at blinding speed. And maybe, uh, yes, for only a second, if you're, uh, um, the way that I am working with Groovy FX, writing my own code that uses Groovy FX, is have the Groovy FX project open in the background and work from the demos, right? Because every single feature that we have is somewhere in the demos. You can very easily copy paste things over and then go from there. That's very productive. Even though I don't normally advertise copy paste, but <laughs> this is the way of doing it. And it's very easy. You're really fastly progressing uh, through your code. So, Andres? So, given the improvements of the code and the new features found in the code, what could be seen as the program for pushing the product? Our question is, was more the um, compliance with the, with the various JDKs and letting people, forcing people to upgrade. My, my point on this is, if you show people what they can do when they upgrade, like, have, have you seen the JavaFX 3D demos yesterday? I mean, that's jaw-dropping. And if that means I have to upgrade to Java 7, I do this instantaneously. Um, you have to provide value, and if you provide value, people will follow. Um, that, having, that being said, I'd like to mention Griffon, because the, um, since Andres is in the room, and Dana, of course, if you set out to do any desktop Java development, have a look at Griffon. Griffon gives you a true application platform, a development platform for Java desktop development, be it Swing or SWT or Groovy, Groovy FX, Java FX, whatsoever, whether it's Groovy or Java or anything else, that's like, I don't know, 10 languages supported or so, you can do it with Griffon. But it gives you the right environment, a module system, plugin system, add-ons, like 160, 170 plugins plus uh, plugins that you want to have. Uh, you have standard sets of icons. You have archetypes, everything. It's, it, um, it's so much faster working with it. 
I can only recommend having a look at Griffon if you do any serious Java desktop development. Yes, please. Now, the question is, um, how, in which cases would I use Griffon and when Dolphin? Both together, right? The client part is desktop development. So the, the, the big application that you have seen on the keynote, all the 3D stuff where you fly through a ship, through a container yard, that's a Griffon application. It is only on the client side, it, ha it is a Griffon application using Groovy FX plugin uh, using Dolphin, using the client Dolphin. And on the server side, it's a Grails application that uses server Dolphin, and in the middle, there's HTTP, right? That is, that is how it works. And, um, and it has worked for us and for our clients. So thank you very much for the question. I've, I guess we call it a, a day for today. Sorry? Well, you, a 3D you, would, demo. you would like to see the 3D demo. Well, I can show you the 3D video. <laughs> Mainly, yep. Is, is video good enough for the 3D video? Oh, good. I can do that. Um, groovy, groovy, groovy. I think groovy. one of the next steps in JavaFX is uh, making 3D objects first class citizens. Where and is then, my... uh, we got to keep up with that. The other thing I like to do with Groovy uh, FX is to start incorporating the JF Extras project, if you're familiar with that. With They have a lot more controls and that type of thing. <clears throat> sure. Oh, I guess I have to do that. Well, it's, it's one simple, uh, similar type feature, but that's not all what Ruby is, right? Yeah, that's true. Ruby lets you capture semantics in Java. Java requires full captures to be final right now. But it's like Ruby, it can be mutable. They do some behind the scenes wrap. That'd be cool if no. I'm, what I can, I've, I haven't prepared that. What, what I can show you is a video that I'm not allowed to show. <laughs> so but without any legal disclaimers, um, this is, this is you know, I, I captured this with my iPhone from one of the early developments of, of the 3D stuff, and uh, please don't hold it against me. And this is one of the presentations, only to give you an, um, a rough idea on how it looks like. Well, we have all these containers. You, you ported that shape transition to this. <laughs> <laughs> this is really safe and very exciting. And yes, you can have, typically the, the shipyard is a little less filled than this one, but you can have uh, color coding for whether how perishable the goods are and so on. Um, it's pretty easy to move around. You center on a certain point and then you can move around the camera. I, I should speak into it. Um, and yes, you can explode um, the, the whole data structure, and we make use of that in a, in a more limited fashion that we explode only one row, such that the, the operator can see what's in that row, because otherwise it would be hidden behind the other ones. So when the, the final thing is not quite that one, even though what you see is, um, and then there's additional thing. And on the right-hand side, you see Jasper. <laughs> um, and there is literally um, tens of thousands of containers in that graph. And that's a scene graph with all the containers in there. And even, even more exciting, I guess it's, it's uh, a few minutes along the row, you'll see a, a big tower on the left-hand side uh, coming in. And this tower is composed of, I don't know, uh, as well 10,000 containers or so. And it is one single node in the scene graph where all the 3D textures are render, uh, combined and give a, rendered tech, give a combined texture on only one node. And it looks as if it was like thousands of nodes. Though there's all kinds of tricks that we do for, uh, for this very smooth, uh, you see it in the back, very, as a glimpse if you've 
if you have been very observant. And um, and yes, the the ship that is in in the docks is um, is made from some space spaceship 3D modeling or so. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is a bit Star Wars like, but it, it it is relevant for business, right? Yeah, even though we, of course we started with um, with playing around. This is truly relevant for business because the way that um, simply because there's a company Nevis who sells it, right? And if you can sell it better, if you can can distinguish yourself from the competition by giving a better user experience, by having more features, being able to accommodate more requirements, then, uh, well, you, then you have an, an advantage in the market. Well, in this Is case, it, like we're doing a, a proof of concept with sunspots, but the sunspots, like doing light, temperature, and all that, this would be great to visualize that, where you could see if the container's overheating or... Perhaps a container can't go above a certain temperature threshold, and you could make that. Well, we red. we have the frozen fish feature. It's yeah. called. So, you may have frozen fish in your in your container, and it needs to be hooked up to the power supply to keep it frozen. And when it starts melting, it you get an an information on the on the system gets like a pulse effect and so. So that's frozen fish feature. <laughs> Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. Um,